This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The first big test of the Bob Quinn era begins in just a few days. It's time to break down just who he should target. We've got a new signing, which could create a little disruption in our draft plans. And of course, we've got to talk about Calvin. This is the Hindsight 20 Podcast, the premier place for all things Detroit Lions. I'm your host, Jerry Mallory. I want to thank each and every one of you for listening. As always, I am a part, a proud part, of the Detroit Sports Podcasting Network. It's not just myself. It's Doc and Jock. It's Tigers Talk. It's Fantasy Geeks. It's one-on-one segments. You name it. It's here at Detroit Sports Countdown, etc., etc. If you got iTunes, then subscribe. If you've got Android, you can still subscribe. I like to use the Pod Bay app, DetroitSportsPodcast.com, the premier place. We're creeping on the come up. We're getting bigger and better. That small little snowball that rolled down the hill, well, it's getting bigger. It's gaining momentum. It's getting faster. That is who we are. Today's show is going to be a fun one. I love lists. I love predictions. I love all those sorts of things. I hope you do too, because we're going to be doing just that. We're going to talk about the recent signing of Teron Walker, how that affects the draft, as well as Calvin Johnson. But in the second half, the thing that I'm looking forward to is the official Jerry Mallory Hindsight 20 Free Agency Guide. I have before me the list of the players the Lions should and possibly will sign. I have some numbers for a few of them. It's the biggest test so far for Bob Quinn. We know the draft is most important, but free agency comes first. That's right around the corner. This Wednesday, I don't have the exact date in front of me. Correct me if I'm wrong. What's it? March 8th? I think it's March 8th. March 9th, perhaps. This upcoming Wednesday. If you're listening to this, it's Monday. In just two short days, Alliance will start filling their roster, bringing in a few guys, veterans, some young ones under the radar, working toward building that championship. So let's talk about, first and foremost, the recent signing. Teron Walker back with the Detroit Lions. I mean, here's a guy. He uh, has tons of potential. He has some interest from uh, several teams. He chose to go with the Lions because he wanted to show that on their one-year show-me deal, he can cash in on his potential. And with the uh, the ultimate goal of getting that big paycheck the following year, well, it didn't work that way. He started off pretty good. Solid start for the Lions showing the potential, showing why he was an attractive free agent type of signing. And then he got hurt. Game four, all said and done, he was, you know, he was out of there. So what he did, went ahead, signed another one-year deal with the Lions. Again, show me deal. And this one makes sense. Remember, the team that was uh, hot for him, so to speak, that was going after him, that he actually turned down. He turned down a two-year deal from was the New England Patriots. Lo and behold, Bob Quinn now with the Lions. Whatever they saw in the Patriots brass, I'm sure Bob Quinn was involved with that. They liked what they saw. They liked the potential, and so they wanted to sign him. Quinn being here, guy already on our team. They didn't waste any time. They bring him back on a one-year deal. Now, having him back on this one-year deal means a couple of things. First and foremost, let's talk about the other guy, Haloti Nada. Uh, From the beginning of this thing, when talking about defensive tackle, I said, hey, you've got Karan Reed. Gabe Wright, and you got other guys, you know, Kudjo and and whatnot, Kyrie Thornton. But what you're going to have to do is sign one, draft one. Sign one being one of the guys uh, that were, you know, free agents formerly of the team between Haloti Nada and Teron Walker, and then draft one. Well, they did just that. They signed one. A lot of people are saying they may sign two, saying Haloti Nada may be back. But until then, they have signed one, and it will be time to draft one. Let me give you some numbers, though. This is a young nucleus of defensive tackles. Those of you that follow me on Twitter— at Jerry Mallory NFL, I talked about that, saying how uh, they have a young nucleus. So that nung, uh, nung, that young nucleus is as follows. You've got the re-signing of Teron Walker, who's only 25 years old. He'll be 26 in about a week or two. Uh, that's still pretty young. Then there's Mr. Karan Reed. Karan Reed had a pretty good year. You know, the first year was a red shirt, so to speak, coming from a small school, not a ton of competition, but people love the, the upside, the strength. 
You know, you lose several defensive tackles. He moves up the depth chart, and uh, he had an injury or two, but he looked pretty good. And it's someone that I think they'll be counting on in the future. And then there's Gabe Wright. Remember, I keep saying this because it's like uh, I kind of liked it at the time because I liked Gabe Wright coming out of Auburn, but the fact that they didn't play him kind of bothers me because we gave up a third-round pick in this year's draft to get back into the fourth round and then to ultimately draft Gabe Wright. Uh, conversation on Twitter, again, you know, one of the guys I go back and forth with, he didn't like how the Lions and the coaching staff used Gabe Wright, didn't use him enough. I kind of agree. Part of me agrees, and I hope the other part uh, of me is wrong, the fact that they didn't use him because he wasn't ready, because he wasn't good enough. Either way, you're looking for Gabe Wright to have a bigger impact. Now, Bob Quinn wasn't the one that signed him, so he is the one married to him, so to speak. But I'm willing to guess he's getting a fair shake and a fair shot this year at, you know, being a a regular in the rotation, not probably breaking that starting lineup. I think Karan Reed, Teron Walker is kind of entrenched unless something happens in free agency in the draft, but it's a rotation. We know injuries happen, et cetera, et cetera. Gabe Bryce, that's a young nucleus. He's only 22 years old. So you've got Wright at 22, Reed at 24, and Walker at 25. I think this says to me, the Lions are not hard pressed in terms of drafting a guy in the first round. You draft a guy in the first round, you hope he makes a pretty big impact that rookie year, uh, and definitely are counting on him in the future. It's a it's a move to uh, change the focus and transition that. Maybe it's an older unit, a struggling unit, and you infuse some youth and talent. Not saying they won't draft a defensive tackle in the first round, but this is one of the reasons why I think they may be looking at other positions. Now, they assigned Haloti Nada back first. He's older, about, what, 32, 33, and they still may do so. You know, a first-round defensive tackle still is legitimate. Teron Walker, only on a one-year deal, but the odds of signing him in the next year, I mean, it's there. He tears it up. He has a great year. You always have the rights of doing a, a non-exclusive franchise tender, a straight-up franchise, which, would, I mean, he would have to just have a tremendous year. But the, the odds of bringing back a guy at 26 if he has a good year, is pretty strong, unlike Haloti Nada, who is probably out the door maybe one or two more years wherever he plays. So the first round pick is not as likely, in my opinion, with the signing of Walker first over Nada, if Nada gets signed at all. Add that to the fact that the depth at the defensive tackle position is there. It's one of the deepest positions in terms of depth in the draft. Several players will fall. You know, 32 teams aren't drafting defensive tackles. A lot of teams don't run the 4-3. So four or three defensive tackles will be available in the second and even the third round. So what I did right now is gave you, uh, I'm, I've given you a list of a few names, guys that are pretty good. We've been talking about them in the first round, but for one reason or another, they may actually be available in the second round where I think the Lions may now target that position if they do so at all. I know I gave you the mock draft last uh, show. It was Sheldon Rankins at defensive tackle number one pick. I have another mock draft coming out soon. Um, I will probably be released on Pride of Detroit. My videos I do there first, it's not defensive tackle anymore. I can see them going for a D tackle now in the second or third round. So what I've done is given you some names in the spirit of, yes, it's a deep draft class. Players will fall. I have two names in the second, two names in the third. Individuals that, you know, in most years it will go probably around earlier, but due to the depth, they could potentially fall. And this would be a perfect situation for the Lions to address. So in the second round, there's two guys. First is Jerron Reed from Alabama. Let's, for, you know, rhyming sake, let's just throw it out there. You've got a starting defensive tackle unit of Jerron Reed and Karan Reed. I mean, Eminem, Jerry Mallory, any famous rapper from Detroit, there's plenty of ammo when you've got Jerron Reed and Karan Reed. I mean, so just for the name alone uh, would be a good fit. But seriously, someone that, you know, and he could very well go in the first. It's about 15 not 15, maybe 10 guys that are like first round quality defensive tackles, in my opinion, all 10 will not go. I think some, you know, have no chance of falling. I don't think Rankins falls at all. I don't think Ashawn Robinson falls at all, but there's a chance that some of these other guys, although being really good, could fall. Yes, I'm talking about Robert Kimdichie. We know his fall from, uh, can you talk today, Jerry? You know about his fall from grace, pun intended, the alcohol falling from about what three floors, the character issues, the stats didn't wow you, motor and uh, you know effort concerns, but he's just a, a freak of nature, God-given talent. 
if he can turn this thing around, if you put his brain into someone uh, that was a lesser person in terms of God-given ability, and you gave that guy that tried hard, you gave that brain to Robert Kim Dietschy, you're looking at one of the best defensive players potentially coming out of this draft, but it doesn't work that way. Science isn't there yet. We're not doing brain swaps. And so with all the talent that he has, there are those issues. And he came to the combine and he didn't do anything to uh, dispel or quiet or make anyone feel comfortable about the rumors or some of the realities that is Robert Kimdichie throwing teammates under the bus um, saying, yeah, well, I was just drunk. I wasn't high. I was just completely drunk. You know, I, I like to drink alcohol. I mean, it was really bad. And now a guy that so much talent, number one pick potential, is probably not going to get picked in the first round because it's too much guarantee, too much money. Second round comes, he will be picked in the second round. I don't even know if he would make it all the way to 16. You know, the, here, here's a scenario where you take the risk on guys. I remember Janoris Jenkins kind of fell in that category. So much talent, but issues, character, concerns, et cetera. So good. Once that second round comes, it's like, well, the the risk is not as high, so let's bring him in. I think Robert Kandichi falls in that category, but he could very well fall. And if you're sitting there at the second round, you have an opportunity to pick up a guy of this ilk, I think the second round is where you go ahead and take the risk. It's kind of becoming that way in the NFL. Now, it's kind of vogue to uh, pick the character guys that are super talented in the second round because it's less risk. You know, we saw it with uh, Randy Gregory last year. You know, you're really good. The first round pick is kind of iffy, but if you're there in the second round, it's worth the risk because you could very well pan out. We've seen the good and the bad, and, um, you know, you, you take each case by an individual standpoint. But Robert Kimdichie in the second round, if he's there, I would kind of be looking at that and saying, yeah, Lions, go ahead. Cash that ticket. Hope you can turn him around. Hope, you know, Jim Caldwell can talk to him, can pray with him, whatever he does with the players that makes him uh, so lovable. Tara Lawson, man, imagine Tara Lawson with his new toy of Robert Kendichi, who you can put on the outside as a defensive end, you be on the inside and just make it all come together. It could be a scary uh, marriage between the talented, uber gifted player with character issues meeting the coach who's like, the the player whisperer, Mr. Jim Caldwell, who they love, and Tara Lawson, the mad scientist on defense. It's like a polygamous situation, uh, and you got to love it. So a couple of guys that could also fall. I think these guys are second-round talent, but they could be there in the third. Again, our third-round pick is a compensatory pick. It will be toward the end of the third round, Jihad Ward out of Illinois. And then you've got Austin Johnson from uh, Penn State. Jihad Ward, think of Jason Jones. He's about... 290-ish pounds, not the biggest guy. He can move in or out, and uh, the versatility is something I'm sure uh, Bob Quinn would appreciate, especially if we don't bring back Jason Jones. Uh, Jihad Ward is a guy that kind of fill that role. So uh, there you have it. Uh, Teron Walker coming in, the young nucleus. I do feel as though the Lions will look in another direction when it comes to the first round. So offensive tackle, linebacker, defensive end, it's all on the board, and yeah, you know, if a certain guy falls to you and it's a D tackle, they could still use one or two. It's a league of depth. It's still a position where you don't have like a Sioux standing there. So it is a possibility, but I think now they change their focus. Calvin Johnson, got to talk about him uh, before we go to the break. I mean, at this point, what do you say? You know, you're, we're sitting and waiting. People are saying the longer we wait, the more likely it is that he's retiring. You know, at this point, I'm just like, give us something and give us something before free agency. It would be nice. Um, do we have extra $11 million or don't we? Do we have to consider what we're going to do with your contract if you stay or what? Uh, we love Calvin, but uh, we love the team as well. And so and I'm, not, I'm not trying to diss Calvin at all. I just want a decision because, you know, in, in 15 years from now, uh, Calvin will be long gone and, and we'll still be cheering for the Lions. And so I always want to just tell people it is team first. We cheer for the players, but we root for the team First and foremost, you know, Sue, biggest Sue fan in the world, he leaves and it's like, okay, we don't like you at all. Ben Wallace, his few years in Chicago, I wasn't rooting for that guy. You hear a lot of people now uh, on social media, on Instagram, Twitter, when they call 97.1 or Detroit Sports 105.1, they're saying, oh, I hope Calvin goes somewhere else and get a ring. I hope he leaves. I, I, I'll cheer for him. I want him this and this and that and blah, 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 blah. It's like, dude. I get the sentiment, 
you know, if Calvin was on another team and it didn't affect the Lions, you know, we're out of the playoff race. We're not, you know, facing him. It doesn't affect us at all. And he has a chance to win. Sure. It's kind of cute, but it's like an asterisk, man. It's like, you know, it's all good, but I'm not sitting here rooting for Calvin. I'm not buying a Calvin jersey if he's playing for the Arizona Cardinals. It's just not happening. I'm a Detroit Lions guy. Um, you know, we got about two or three days as you're listening to this. I'm hoping a decision comes out. You know, like I said, you know, best of both worlds, but I think it's highly unlikely as he comes back and they do a new cap friendly deal. I just don't see that happening. Something's have something's got to give. You keep hearing more and more people say, guys, he's really hurt. It really is the injury. He really is banged up, and this is why he's not coming back. You've got to kind of you've got to start taking people's word for it. The more you hear it, it's like a momentum deal. And if that's the case, okay. That means we have an extra $10 million. I just don't want him to sit here and mull over the, the decision and free agency is a week or two gone. It may be a marquee free agent you would have looked at. You know, the whole way you kind of structure this thing based on if you got an extra $11 million is quite substantial. I would hate for him to leave and say, yeah, I'm retiring a week or two into free agency. And that means, well, hey, we would have looked at, I don't know, Mario Williams, Eric Weddle, Eric Berry, et cetera, et cetera, but we didn't know if we had the 11 million extra or not. And then all of a sudden he does leave. That's what I don't want to happen. No matter what, you love Calvin. He's meant so much to the team. I've got videos of me singing to him with a guitar and and doing all type of crazy things on YouTube. Look it up. It's out there. And so I'm not here to dog him, but I'm a Lions fan. I'm here for the team first and the way they're going to go about structuring their free agency and the guys they can target, how much they can offer, you know, eleven million is a is a lot. It's a, a substantial amount of money to sit there and to have or not have. So in the next couple of days, Calvin, I know you're still thinking about it, but coming from Jerry Mallory, one of your bigger fans, coming from Detroit Sports Podcast and Pride of Detroit, give us something. Give us a yes. Give us a no. So Bob Quinn and company can know what they are able to do or how limited they will be. Either way, we've got money to spend, and it's not like we have to spend all $40 million in free agent money if Calvin were to leave, but it's good to have the option. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it's time. I have before me, I got this paper. You hear me crumbling it up. Right here before me, I have the official Hindsight 20 free agent wish list. And just to kind of whet your appetite, I've got a receiver on here. We've got a cornerback. Uh, we've got linebacker, we've got safety, we've got offensive line, we've got tight end, we've got running back, we've got defensive end. This paper has a lot of new Lions coming to the fold for the 2016 season, so stay right here on the Hindsight 20 as we break down the official free agent wish list for the Detroit Lions. Jerry Maller here for the Hindsight 20 podcast. It's simple. Your ad can be placed right here. If you want your ad being mentioned with one of the fastest growing local podcasts here in the Metro Detroit area, Detroit sports podcast, my show, maybe even some other shows, send us an email, hindsight20podcast at gmail.com. Let's make it happen. All right, we're back on the hindsight 20. As we mentioned, it's time. The Lions in the offseason is about to kick off, and free agency is right around the corner. So I have a list. I was crumbling that paper right in front of you. It's a very important list. It's a wish list for the Lions. It's kind of a combination, too. It's a combination of guys I think the Lions would target based on their skill set, based on what we know about the team as, a, as it's constructed with Caldwell and company, Cooter, Austin, as well as you know, Bob Quinn, some of his new philosophies, some of the things he said about depth. Uh, there are players that I like. You know, there were guys that oftentimes there were three or four people for one spot, and I kind of considered who would be the best case scenario. I factored in money, how much we have to spend. You know, I'm not naming the top five free agents. That's not realistic. You can only spend so much money. I've kind of, uh, it, it, so it's it's a, it's like a gumbo. Guys I like, guys I think they like, you know, realistic contract prices, et cetera, et cetera couple of hometown discounts in there. And, and so here's the official wish list. And uh, 
to start off, we're going to take care of some in-house business. Darius Slay, a uh, big contract extension. It is coming. He will be one of, if not the highest paid corner in the league. I think he'll be just under your Shermans and your Patrick Petersons. And so look for him to get in and around 13-ish, maybe a 13 and a and a notch of $13.5 million contract re-signing uh, to stay with the team. There's a few other guys that we have to consider. I don't know if uh, Quinn's going to want to re-sign some of these guys now or wait to the offseason where it's a ton of them because you've got Sam Martin, really good punter, one of the best in the league, Devin Taylor. You've got Theo Reddick, one of, if not the best pass catching running back in the league. And then you've got big Larry Warford. All these guys, impending free agents next year, they can sign them to longer-term contracts. This offseason, maybe one or two gets done, but um, you know the other ones, maybe they'll consider uh, once that offseason comes. We know Ziggy Ansah isn't going anywhere. Uh, the fifth-year option will be picked up in the offseason. And uh, so they'll have, you know, this whole year he signed on, all of next year he'll be signed on. I think at that point you look at a contract extension. If not, you slap that franchise on him. He's staying with the Detroit Lions. Whether he wants to or not, we're holding him hostage, if you will. I think he'll be staying up. So in terms of in-house, I've got two free agent signings, guys that I think the team is going to bring back, and uh, they'll be back in the fold. And, uh, and also, when I'm giving you this list, I don't have the prices for all of these guys. I've just got the estimated prices for, like, the top three. And uh, the other ones will be in and around, you know, market value. Use your imagination on it. I've, I broke it down to where we had, you know, the 30-whatever million and kind of finagled it. You got to consider drafts. I didn't get crazy with it. Here are some realistic signings. So the uh, the two in-house signings, Issa abdul Kadus. I'm hearing a lot of love. For George, was it Ioka, Aloka, Iloka? I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, and hey, if they on the free agency said this is the guy we want, I'd be fine with it. He's pretty big. He's uh, got some size and he's got speed. Really good against the run. He's kind of like a younger James Ahedabo. So you know Ahedabo in his glory year, year one with the Lions was a really good combo with Glover Quinn. So I get that because Quinn is the free safety and he can cover. And then you've got. Uh, the young James Ahedabo and George Ioka, Iloka, excuse me, I don't know how to pronounce his name, and the pairing worked before, and you look at Terrell Austin trying to have something similar. So I get that. I really do. But I'm giving the nod to my boy Issa abdul Kadus. He stepped in the second half of that season, replacing James Ahedabo, and was a really good safety. He already has the range. I like two safeties with range. He brought that because he can cover some ground, but boy, he really showed that one of the supposed weaknesses, run coverage, he was a short tackler. I think that he earned himself a shorter-term deal, and it allows you, if you're not giving Ioka the money, to move that money into other areas. So Issa abdul Kadus is the guy that I would love to bring in, or rather bring back. Now, safety has some other considerations. Uh, we definitely want to do something at safety. We've got one as a, as a starter in Glover Quinn, so either Issa's coming back, we know the draft is an option. I talked about Sua Cravens last week as a second-round option. Some other guys, Eric Berry, you be breaking the bake for him. He uh, came off of uh, just a horrible illness with cancer and had just a wonderful year. Great story. He's going to get paid. Uh, Tashawn Gibson is another one. He kind of had a, uh, a, a, a a low year. The year before, he was pretty good, had some injuries. Maybe you can get him on a cheap show-me deal. Eric Weddle is older, but... You know, coming from a veteran standpoint, you bringing this guy in, I wouldn't be mad at that. But like I said, my official wish list consists, and I'm, and I'm going to give options for all of these guys, other guys considered, uh, when I'm talking about the ultimate person on my list. The guy for me is bringing back Issa abdul Kadus. The other guy we're bringing back is Tahir Whitehead because of the flexibility. He showed two years ago that he can man the middle. Bob Quinn already said, you know, the three linebacker thing is not really the norm. The Lions run a lot of nickel. So you really want uh, to make sure you have two guys with speed and range. And we know that to hear Whitehead definitely gives you that. To hear Whitehead's flexibility is a key. Again, he played the middle, but he can also play the outside. And so when you have those uh, sets, because they are going to have sets where there is three linebackers. He can play the middle or the outside. And when it's a definite passing down, he showed that he does have decent range, and he can do that as well. Now, he struggled at the beginning of the year, and you're kind of like, man, you know, he was definitely not the Tahir Whitehead 2014, or excuse me, 2000, yeah, 2014. So I kind of go back and forth on it. 
I don't know how much money he would demand. I would hope it's not too much. I think he's worth about $4 million-ish, like a three-year, $12 million deal. I know with inflation of the cap going up, things can change. The price could change for everybody. But I'm predicting that he's one of the guys coming back. He fits that gumbo of a guy I like, the guy, guy I know they already like, and the price will be decent so let's pick and choose some of these positions and the guys i have my reasonings behind the rest of this official hindsight 20 free agent wish list so if for cornerback they hear me out you know you've got some younger guys that would make you know sense because they're good and they're young whether it's uh sean smith who's you know sub 30 prince amukamura a guy that a lot of us you know years ago before we drafted nick fairly we thought that man prince amukamura was the guy that we were going to draft in the 2000 and uh, what was that 2010 draft or something like that 2011 draft no it was and so you've got some young guys like that even janoris jenkins a guy that i was kind of rooting for the lions to take a risk and draft at 23 in the 2012 draft a lot of people called me crazy on it whatever um but i don't think we're gonna go that route darius slay already there he's gonna be one of the best corners in the league I think you've got Nevin Lawson, who show he can play some outside. But uh, like my boy, um, my boy Chris said, Chris Gandy from those Detroit guys said, uh, Nevin Lawson is a guy that, along with Quandry Diggs, will both probably be more so in the slot. Then you have Alex Carter. I've got high hopes for him. He has the size, speed combination you love. The work ethic is supposedly there. Very smart. You know, studies the film. All the things kind of add up. And so you've got this young nucleus of cornerbacks. You know, a couple of them can play outside, inside, pretty good in the slot. I don't think you go out and you spend big money on a Janoris Jenkins. You go out and spend big money on a Prince Amu Kamora. I think you just need another Rasheen Mathis. Older guy that can sit there and start if need be. And uh, if he gets beat out, which you hope he gets beat out by a younger guy, he gets beat out by Carter or Lawson, then fine. Injuries happen, he can step right in and you don't have to pay him a ton of money. So that being said, the guy I've pegged for the Lions is Leon Hall. He's got some Michigan ties. He played at U of M. He was a Wolverine. He's getting up there now. He's uh, on the north side of 30. Didn't have the greatest of years, but I think um, in, 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 in the essence of Rasheen Mathis, a guy with a new turn on life, a new opportunity, still can be decent. He's there for insurance. If you need him, he's there. I'm not for breaking the bank on a guy because we're about to break the bank on Darius Slay. So Leon Hall is my pick as Rasheen Mathis 2.0. Now, moving on to offensive tackle. Again, I really thought about this. I said, man, what, what are their philosophies? I really think they're going to be pegging an offensive tackle in round one or two, really leaning toward that. So you got Riley Reef. And you've got Michael Ola. I'm pretty sure Michael Ola will be back with the Lions. Reef is a free agent after next year, any way you, any way you slice it. So you've got him for at least one more year. <sighs> is he a right tackle? Is he a left tackle? Then you've got the draft. I'm really confident they're going to be drafting a tackle. And so I'm just already pegging them as a guy that will compete and possibly start at right tackle that they draft in rounds one or two. So what do they do? Do they try to break the bank? You know, Cordy Glenn, no longer a possibility. They try to break the bank on a Kelvin Beecham, who I think will be there on a show-me deal. Uh, Two-year, maybe, I don't know, $16 million. He showed a lot of potential with the Steelers, got hurt, and um, maybe he'll sign a short deal hoping that he can bank on that. Russell Okun, more of a name now than actual talent, but he's still decent. Kalichi Osalemi, Osamale, Osama, Osama Lama. You know what I'm talking about. The big fella from the Baltimore Ravens. Well, those will be considerations. I just don't think they're going to break the bank. I've got two positions where they will, in my opinion, quote unquote, break the bank. And for me, breaking the bank is north of like $6 million or so, spending a nice chunk of change. I don't think it's going to be on offensive tackle. I think they address it in free agency in terms of an older guy. There'll be some June 1st cuts to consider, and they'll be drafting a guy early on. But a guy they will bring in who is, you know, he's good, he can play right tackle, he's a hometown kid, Cast Tech, gotta give props to my boys, Cast Tech's Joseph Barksdale, someone that has been really good and solid and serviceable. I know it's not a ringing endorsement, I'm not sitting here trying to pretend that he's the next Trent Williams, he's not. He's a definite upgrade, though, at right tackle. Uh, for anything we had last year, 
except for, you know, Michael Ola did look good. But when we talk about uh, your Adrian Waddles and, you know, all those other bumps, Cornelius Lucas, you know, Joe Barksdale is someone that he's sitting there. So you draft a guy in the first round, you've got him and Reef starting. Barksdale's ready. Reef goes down, Barksdale's ready. Um, maybe that rookie isn't quite ready. Barksdale is ready. Michael Ola not, you know, living up to his potential as the right tackle that he did in flashes 2015. You get the theme. Joseph Barksdale is ready. He's a hometown kid from Detroit. We should be able to get him on a decent deal because he's up there in age. And uh, I would be really comfortable bringing a guy like Joseph Barksdale to the fold. So that's my guy for offensive tackle. And we didn't break the bank because I think we'll ultimately go ahead and try to bring in a guy via the draft. Okay, moving right along to our next position is running back. Again, a position we may end up drafting. We need someone to compliment Amir Abdullah. He's the lightning. We need to find his thunder. Then you've got Theo Reddick, who's the pass-catching threat. Yes, we know Zach Zinner's there. George Wynn is there. Maybe one of them steps up. We don't know. The gumbo of this one, the heavy ingredient, you know, because gumbo is a ton of different things. Um, and you have various ingredients like this free agent gumbo. You've got Jerry's preference uh, is, I don't know what, the the sausage. You've got uh, the Lions in terms of Caldwell or Cooter or Austin is uh, the crawfish. You've got Bob Quinn, his influence, guys, he's familiar with. That's the shrimp. So the shrimp is the main ingredient for our running back free agent list gumbo. Stephen Ridley, a guy I think we bring in. Decent price. He didn't have the best of years, and he fits the mold. Um, Quinn is used to what he can do. He played in New England a number of years. Quinn may have been instrumental in drafting him. He's a big guy, 225 pounds. He's a bruiser, and guess what? He's a plus in blocking. That's one of the areas we definitely have to address. Losing Joyke Bell. Joyke Bell, very underrated as a pass blocker. You bring in Steven Ridley. There are no guarantees. There isn't a huge contract a number of years. You can still look at 16 and say, hey, Ezekiel Elliott, we want you. Or in the second round, you say, hey, Derrick Henry, we want you. You'll never sit there and say, oh, man, we really should look at Ezekiel Elliott, but we've got Stephen Ridley signed on. It's the perfect signing. He can fill a role, fits a need. He's used to um, playing in that role as a, blue, a bruiser and a blocker. Bob Quinn knows him, and he won't prohibit you, either money-wise or from drafting a guy because you're bringing him in as a stopgap for a couple of years. I think Stephen Ridley had, um, you know, he just had a down year. He was there with the Jets. Chris Ivory really came out and just... You know, whereas Ridley was supposed to be the guy, Ivory just had a great year. And he said, you know what? I'm taking over. I'm going to be the starter. And Ridley wasn't up to the task. A guy like this allows Amir Abdullah to get a good number of carries. But in short yardage, goal line situations, if you need a workhorse for a game or two, Ridley is your guy. So I haven't gone to any of the big signings yet for a reason. I'm saving those two for last. We're, we're going to be spending a good chunk of money. So we've got tight end. I think we'll be bringing in two tight ends. We're going to be tight end heavy on this team. I think the offense is going to be relying on it. Uh, they have a lot of faith that Eric Ebron is going to have that breakout year. And still, though, this offense, the way they're going to run, needs a couple of guys. I've got one guy that is hometown that, you know, hey, we don't know how much gas is left in the tank. But we're going to find out. Antonio Gates from Central High School. It'll be my neighborhood school from back in the day. Didn't go there. Would have if I didn't go to the great Cast Tech. He's coming on the veterans minimum. It's not a show me deal. It's not anything but a hometown discount. You know, last year he still had some productivity. So it's not just this big charity and he comes his last year playing for Detroit and he waves hands and he's done. No, he's coming to contribute. He's going to be that secondary guy in terms of pass catching. Uh, Eric Ebron, two tight end sets. You've got two options. Um, Big Gates is a little bit more sure-handed, a little bit better of a blocker. He's kind of the guy that can block a little bit and catch a little bit. Ebron is really your pass catching tight end. Now, for blocking tight ends, I think we bring in a guy in Jermaine Gresham. Now, when Gresham came out, people said he was going to be this athletic freak. He was going to be the pass-catching threat. You know, people thought of Kellen, uh, Kellen Winslow and uh, Vernon Davis. Well, it just didn't work that way. Lo and behold, watch some tape on this guy. He's become one of the better blocking tight ends in the NFL. Very effective for the Arizona Cardinals last year. And so I think we bring in two tight ends, one to be your blocker, 
want to be your kind of quasi catcher, quasi blocker. Both should be on relatively cheap deals. One's a hometown discount. Again, it's Antonio Gates. It's Jermaine Gresham. They're not trying to challenge Eric Ebron, but if there is an injury to Ebron, again, depth, this is the key. If we're relying on tight ends being a big function of our team, if Ebron goes down, we don't want to sit there like we have the last few years and rely on uh, Tim Wright to be the guy, okay? We've had tons of injuries, and we know that uh, the Brandon Pettigrew situation is up in the air. Again, cutting him is a little tricky because he had that ACL, so you're not saving a ton of money because of uh, the way those contracts work out. That being said, my two tight ends that I'm bringing in, Jermaine Gresham and Antonio, the hometown boy, Gates. So we got to talk about receiver, right? I think if Calvin stays or goes, we're bringing in a guy. And I'm looking at a little bit of size, a little bit of speed, maybe someone that, you know, they've been kind of behind on the depth chart. They've played on a system that doesn't pass the ball a ton. And there were three guys that end up in the race. It was Jermaine Curse. It was Muhammad Sanu. It was Marvin Jones. I like all of these guys for different reasons. Muhammad Sanu, uh, you know, he has the size. You know, he has the vertical leap. And uh, he showed a lot. But my issue with him, he corrected this somewhat last year, is his drops. And so I, I nixed him out because 2014, the year before, he was one of the worst in terms of dropping the football. You've already got Eric Ebron on your team. Like I said, and you're building a team. Yeah, you got one guy you really like that's talented but struggles with drops. You don't want two guys out there at all times where it's kind of like, you got to work on those hands, buddy. So Muhammad Sanu is disqualified. So it comes down to two guys, Jermaine Curse and Marvin Jones, for your wide receivers. Like them both. Curse, you know, you always think about Golden Tate, a guy that, you know, underutilized with the Seattle Seahawks, given an expanded role, playing with a quarterback that likes to, to throw the ball around. And man, did he uh, flourish Golden Tate, one of the better number two receivers in all of the NFL. Bargain of a deal, six years, 36 million. You got to love what he can bring to the table. And so he's a consideration. However, Marvin Jones is your winner. Marvin Jones is the guy we'll sign. And uh, I'll give you some numbers. I think we signed him to a five-year deal worth $35 million. Pretty good money, $7 million a year. And you're hoping that he can transform into a number one option. Now, Calvin is Calvin. And we're not getting out Sean Jeffrey, so you got to really modify how you look at this. Tate, Marvin Jones, kind of similar. 1A, 1B, you know, some people say Tate is better. I don't know. I really like Marvin Jones. I think, you know, being behind A.J. Green kind of helps. But I think at the same time, the targets isn't there. You've got uh, Tyler Eifert, Muhammad Sanu, A.J. Green, Marvin Jones. It's a lot of guys that can catch the ball. Giovanni Bernard out the backfield. And so I think if he's asked to do more, he will do more. I love his size, his speed. He's like a four, four, five ish guy. A lot of speed, really strong at his combine. Uh, a few years ago, he was the leader of receivers, 22 reps. So to me, that says it's a guy, if you try to press him, huh? Well, guess what, cornerbacks? He's going to press you back, and he just might win a matchup or two. Expanded role for him. He's a number one-esque option slash number two. You know, it's going to be a mix. If Calvin's gone, you look at potentially a guy you're drafting, but then even if you don't draft a guy, you're going to have to get creative. A mixture of uh, Ebron, Golden Tate, Wherever you sign, like I said, for me, it's Marvin Jones, five years, $35 million, and uh, let's see what happens. Let's see if he can get it done. You want that opportunity? You're sick of being behind A.J. Green? Come out. Show what you can do. If you want to be a number one receiver, we just might have an opening. Come out and earn it. You're not going to beat out A.J. Green. It's not happening in Cincinnati. Sorry. It just doesn't work that way. But here, if Calvin's gone, it's wide open open. It's the wild, wild west. Show that you've been held back. Show that with more opportunity, you can thrive. I've seen some games where, yes, Marvin Jones has dominated. Come here, do it on a consistent basis, and the number one receiving spot will be handed to you. The last guy, we're going to take a bit of a risk, but it's a smart risk, and we're going to spend some good money on him. It's at the defensive end position. There was two guys I thought about. Mario Williams was definitely a consideration. I think that he gets a deal similar to what we saw with Julius Peppers when he left. Um, when he left Chicago, it was like 10 years annually. Same with Jared Allen. He signed a deal. It was about 10 years annually. Guys, they're a little up there in age, but still productive. They get about that, 10 years annually. I thought about Mario Williams, but then I looked, and I said, there's another guy 
that because of injuries and, and you know, it's a weird situation, will be at a discount. Normal years, he's getting 15, 16, 17, 18 million. But he's got a lobster for a hand, a lobster claw for a hand. Jason Pierre Paul, at only 27 when the season starts, years old, four years, 40 million. It's a bit of a risk. But if you look at the last few games, last four or five games with the Giants, he kind of got back into that form. And according to Pro Football Focus, he was a top 10 defensive end in the 3-4 those last seven games of the year. No one's going to spend 15, 16, 17 million on him him because there is still the risk with the hand. What's going to become of him? However, he comes out this upcoming year, balls out, the money's going to be there. He's going to be worth 15 million plus. You take the risk, you offer him a little bit more in terms of years than most teams would want to do. Four years, 40 million, you bring him in. Now imagine Ziggy Ansah, who was compared to JPP all this time, on one side, and then Ziggy Ansah on the other. So JPP, oh, I said Ziggy twice, didn't I? Imagine this, I'm sorry. Yeah, really imagine Ziggy on one side and Ziggy on the other side. Just forget about it. But seriously, imagine JPP on one side, Ziggy Ass on the other. Four years, he's in his prime. You're, you're risking it because he's got the lobster claw forehand, but I think he showed enough on film where you can take that risk. Now, the, the one option is, you know, if Jerry Mallory sees this, 29, 30, maybe even all the 32 GMs saw that, yeah, he's lobster claw, but he looked pretty good. And so I may be lowballing on what JPP actually gets. It's just a weird situation. So I don't know if he's going to get... Uh, you know, closer to 13, 14, because people believe in him, or it's going to be all the way down to like a one-year deal worth one, uh, worth like $8 million. I don't really know. It's a weird situation. And so I said the Lions take the risk by offering him more years, and four years, $40 million, if he, you know, comes back to form, is a steal for a guy at that position. So that's the free agent list, guys. You've got Marvin Jones as receiver, cornerback Leon Hall. We're bringing back to here Whitehead for linebacker, Issa Abdul Kadus for safety, hometown kid coming back to Detroit, Joe Bark still at offensive tackle, tight end. We're getting two guys, Jermaine Gresham, Antonio Gates. Running back, it's the shrimp of the gumbo, Stephen Ridley. And a defensive end, we're spending our most money on this position. We want to make this a strength. You remember 2011 where our line was the strength. Vanden Bosch was still decent. Cliff Averill getting things done. Dominican Sue up the middle, Nick Fairley. Even a couple years ago with Sue and Fairley still in the middle with Ziggy Ansah coming in his own. Jason Jones. We want to make that the strength this time. And you've got to count for two guys. Ziggy Ansah on one side. And then the lobster claw himself, Jason Pierre Paul. Four years, forty million, get it done. It's going to be a big, instrumental, important, uh, huge, monumental. Uh, I don't know however many adjectives you want to use. It's going to be a huge week for the Detroit Lions. Big week for the boys. It's time to see what Bob Quinn does. Does he break the bank? Does he go the Patriot way and get smart? Does he get creative? Will Calvin Johnson retire? There's so much we got to look forward to. Next week's podcast is going to be fun. We're going to be talking about hopefully player or two that's new to the Detroit Lions. In any event, rain, sleet, snow, hail, you name it. We'll be back next Monday giving you all the news, views, and opinions of the Detroit Lions. As always, I can be found on Twitter at Jerry Mallory NFL. I'm also on Pride Detroit doing some videos there. And yes, I'm here. Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Premier, the only place you need to go to for your Detroit fix for podcasting, listening, news views and opinions guys i want to thank each and every one of you for listening until next time i'm out of here this is jerry mallory for the hindsight 20 p-o-d cat